produced in high definition by Fox 50. Viewer discretion is advised. He shoved a girl off a cliff. Tonight, the search continues for this mountain man on the run. NC Wanted in high definition starts now. Good evening, I'm Gerald Owens. Welcome to NC Wanted. Tonight we come to you from the Hillsborough Courthouse in Orange County. It's small town courtrooms like this that serve as the front line for justice in our state. But tonight we profile a man who for more than two decades has avoided his day in court. We're talking about one of the most notorious fugitives in North Carolina history, Richard Lynn Bear. Since escaping a Wilkes County jail in 1985, Bear's mugshots and AIDS progression photos have been a fixture on wanted lists throughout the country. And reminiscent of the infamous Eric Rudolph, Richard Bear has eluded countless manhunts and searches in the remote mountain regions of our state. Some say he's been able to do it by disguising himself as a woman. And like Eric Rudolph, some believe Richard Bear has avoided capture in part with the help from mountain locals. He took my daughter's life. She never got to enjoy seeing her daughter graduate. She never liked to see her daughter get married. Her life is gone, and he's living his life like nothing ever happened. I don't have the mama to talk to when I have problems. I don't have nobody really to be there for me like some people do, they still have parents they can go to if they need help. But I've never experienced that. Nobody can ever bring that back. Sherry Lyle Hart is a young single mother whose life revolves around her six-year-old daughter, April. But when she leaves home for a night on the town on January 15th, 1984, it will be the last time April ever sees her mother. Next morning and she wasn't here and then my husband went out and looking for her and he found her car at Ingalls. We began to think that something bad happened. I was hoping that she was okay. After Sherry's father finds the abandoned car at the Sky City Discount Store in West Jefferson, her family files a missing persons report with the Ash County Sheriff's Office. But seasons change and there is still no sign of Sherry. By now, another winter is setting in, snow on the ground and temperatures dipping below freezing. And it was just a, a, a mystery. There was never a lead developed as to what occurred. Then, in December of 1984, an unrelated petty crime gives investigators a bit of hope. We had a breaking and entering at a convenience store in the western uh, part of the county. The safe was uh, taken. Subsequently, we found out who uh, was responsible for the break-in. They told us that they had thrown this safe over the mountain on 16 on the Wilkes and Ash line at a place called the Jumping Off Place. Harnessed in, Ash County deputies rappelled down the mountain near the Jumping Off Place to recover the safe that's stolen during a store robbery. What they stumble upon is even more shocking. While we were standing around, uh, one of the, off the other deputy with me asked me, so who's that you were standing on? And I looked down and, and I saw the hand sticking up, the skeletal hand sticking up out of the mud there. As recovery efforts begin, investigators wonder if this is the body of Sherry Hart or another young girl who disappeared from Wilkes County two years earlier. We had no DNA, none of the modern forensic methods of identification in 1984. Every bone was recovered. And that assisted 
the anthropologist because she could absolutely determine that it was a, a female. There was no question when uh, uh, the doctors uh, completed their investigation that it was Sherry Lyle's heart. We just happened to swing in exactly the right spot uh, where Sherry was. If we'd have been a little above it, a little below it, we still may have never found her. Now a death investigation, detectives search for clues about how Sherry ended up at the bottom of the cliff. They begin retracing her final steps. It'd been suicide, it'd been homicide, and somebody just had accidentally fell off. She wouldn't have left April. It wasn't like her to not come home. And I don't think she would have left without letting me know where she was at because she, she tried not to worry me. Everyone that we could conceivably think of was interviewed as friends, neighbors. We would even go into town on Sunday night and do what now is commonly referred to as a road check. We subsequently did learn from kids, really, that had seen Sherry Hart with Richard Lynn Bear and Jeffrey Burgess on this particular Sunday night. After months of investigation, a clearer picture of how Sherry died starts to emerge. Her last night alive, Sherry's mother agrees to watch her daughter so Sherry can go out on a date. Instead, she stood up and goes into town to pass the time. She runs into two acquaintances from school, Richard Lynn Bear and Jeff Burgess. The two persuade her to get into their car and ride around town. They rode around West Jefferson toward Wilkes County. Uh, they stopped on one occasion and she had requested to go to the bathroom. Then they ultimately came to a, a top of the mountain, which is on Highway 16. She again requested to use the restroom and they stopped just inside Wilkes County. She got out of the car. Bear made some comment that he was going after her. Sherry came running back down with uh, Bear immediately behind her. She was uh, screaming, trying to get away from him. We believe that Bear had a weapon pistol and struck Sherry in the back of the head with the weapon after she ran back to the car and got with Burgess. They at that point in time put her in the car. Bear ordered uh, Burgess to drive. He drove down the highway and stopped at the edge of the cliff jumping off place. Bear took Sherry out of the car and ordered Burgess to drive down the road, turn around and come back. And when he returned, Bear was standing on the side of the road. Sherry was nowhere to be seen. Richard Bear and Jeff Burgess become the targets of the investigation. And we knew that we had to find these two people and either place them actively involved or eliminate them. And as it turned out, we did not eliminate them. And they then became the suspects and ultimately became the defendants in the death uh, and disappearance of Sherry Hart. Authorities place Bear and Burgess at the scene, but work to piece together why it happened. Simply uh, sexual, very bluntly put. Her not wanting to be involved in such a relationship is why she's not here today. 
With enough evidence to charge Bear and Burgess with the murder of Sherry Lyle Hart, both are taken to the Wilkes County Detention Center to await trial. It's an older style, linear style jail. Uh, have four uh, specific main cell blocks. Uh, Mr. Bear was in one of those four main cell blocks where we house pretrial prisoners. At that point in time, we had um, three shifts. We worked a first, a second, and a third shift, eight hours each. Uh, the officers were supposed to, when they came in, do a count. One Sunday afternoon, I'd come to work at uh, four o'clock and I'd met Agent Cabe there at the door. And he uh, pointed out to me that we had an off-duty jail officer across the street over there at the courthouse with Richard Bear's sister. And I spoke with the jailer and told him that, uh, you know, this, this wasn't right. He was setting himself up for a bad opportunity, and he told me that was none of my business. Uh, what he did on his off-duty time was his business and none of, none of mine. Investigators say the relationship that develops between the jailer and Bear's sister ultimately wins him his ticket to freedom. I found out later that week when I came to work that Bear was gone, and it happened sometime between second and third shift. That jail officer was working third shift. She didn't have to help him escape. And she helped him to escape. And I'm angry with her. With no security cameras in place and no eyewitnesses, the guard is simply fired. He could have brought him out to under the guise of getting medication, making a phone call, and then just allowed him to just hide for a period of time until he was certain nobody else was around him to see this happen. Just let him walk right out the door. It's been 23 years since Richard Bear's escape and investigators are still baffled as to how he's eluded them all this time. When he left the jail, he disappeared. We have had only one substantial lead that we can definitively say that it was probably him. Shortly after Bear disappears, the state makes a deal with Jeff Burgess, which allows him to live outside of prison until Bear is caught. Under the agreement, Burgess will testify against Bear and stand trial for his own role in Sherry's murder. But investigators will not give up hope that that day in court will come. There will be a day, and there will be a courtroom, and there will be justice. Meanwhile, not a day goes by that Betty Lyle doesn't think about her daughter. Being a Christian, you're supposed to forgive others as you want them to forgive you. I have prayed about it, but I've never come to the place that I could forgive them. If they were paying for what they did, I might be able to. I feel like that that some way, somehow, he will end up paying. I would have given my life in exchange for hers, but it doesn't work that way. But it was, it was the hardest thing I ever did, was give up my daughter. They're out there living a life, and mama, she's gone just over one mistake one night, but she don't have a life, and they're out there living one. We contacted Richard Bear's sister, who still lives in Ashe County. We asked for her reaction to accusations her brother was involved in the murder of Sherry Hart. Do you want to know what I think? They never did prove that. Of course he did leave, so that didn't look good on him. So, you know, what can I say? Do I know where he is? You know I don't. Look, I don't have a thing else to say about it. I don't think he's guilty. Despite what she says, investigators still believe Richard Bear's sister was having a relationship with a jailer and may have persuaded the jailer to unlock Bear's jail cell and look the other way while he escaped. 
Tonight, it's time to finally put Richard Bear back behind bars. There's at least a $12,000 reward for the person with information leading to his capture. Maybe tonight, that person is you. At the time of the murder, Bear was described as 5'7 to 5'8, about 175 pounds, with brown hair and green eyes. He would be 43 today and may have put on some weight. He also may have altered his appearance entirely and even changed his name. Some say he may avoid detection by dressing as a woman. Anyone with information about Richard Lynn Bear should call us toll free at 1-866-43-WANTED. That's 1-866-439-2683. Or log on to ncwanted.com and click report a tip. You don't have to reveal your identity. Now. Sheriff Donnie Harrison takes you inside Wake County's high-tech jail. From the old days, it was just detention officer taking the person to jail and had the key and you take them to the dining room, to different places. All that's changed. The thing now is uh, less movement. The more you move an inmate, the more likely you have someone to try to escape. This is the control room, and you see they're monitoring everything that goes on throughout this jail. You can open any door or close any door, lock down any door. This is your typical 56-man pot. You see the officer sits here, and um, you know he can open and lock any cell door. With having uh, the video, you stay right in your cell pod or uh, connected to the cell pod. Uh, is a room that we can just walk them in, still in secure custody. Uh, they sit down and, and talk to the judge and the lawyers just like if they were in the courtroom. Same thing with visitation. You know, um, their families want to come to see them. Now they don't even have to leave, leave their cell or the pod that they're in. It's for safety reasons and for uh, expediting the visits. I mean, we can, um, more people can visit uh, if we go this route. If not, we were continuously bringing them back and forth, which is a security risk. Every time a person is moved, we try to make sure they're searched. Uh, if they go to court, we try to make sure they're searched. When they come back, we try to make uh, sure they're searched. When we bring a person in, we have an area back there that uh, it locks behind them. The people in the control booth watch them coming in. Once the vehicle is in, uh, the gates close behind them, so it's a secure area there when we're transporting from the vehicle to the jail. You go in one door, it opens, you go in, it locks behind you, then the next door opens. Safety feature. Uh, both doors won't be open at the same time at any time. They have a lot of time on their hands, and they're always thinking anything that they can think of to get outside and uh, because of boredom. Um, they'll take that opportunity. That's the reason we try to stay ahead of the game with this modern technology. Coming up, a notorious member of a Mexican drug cartel escapes custody during a routine roundup in Wayne County. More NC Wanted is straight ahead. Now, here's another unsolved case we need to tell you about. It's the summer of 2004. After months of phone taps and continuous surveillance, investigators discover a Mexican-based drug cartel operating smaller cells in Goldsboro and Mount Olive, North Carolina. They link 25-year-olds Alex Soto and Arnulfo Ramirez to the group. The two men work with a lawyer in Mexico named Alfredo Granados Garcia. He provides them with several kilos of cocaine and marijuana. Garcia coordinates with Soto and Ramirez to have a driver bring an average of 8 to 10 kilos of narcotics into the country on a regular basis, each worth about $20,000 and carefully transported in vehicles with hidden compartments to throw off border guards. Soto and Ramirez in turn distribute the supply to interested clients. Authorities discover that a trailer belonging to Ramirez's father off Zion Church Road in Goldsboro is a stash for the drugs and the location for much of the drug activity. After intercepting communication and even witnessing deals made to third parties, authorities gather enough evidence to get arrest warrants for Garcia, Soto and Ramirez. Then on June 10th, 2004, they decide to make their move. 
While staking out the grounds around the trailer, they wait for Soto and Ramirez to come outside. When both men leave the trailer and get into a car, investigators follow close behind. Shortly after, they pull the car over and arrest the men on the spot. Meanwhile, investigators have coordinated with law enforcement in Texas to arrest Garcia, who they find is in the U.S. on this particular day. Authorities put Ramirez in one car and Soto in another. But somehow Soto manages to wiggle out of his handcuffs, get out of the car, and take off on foot. Hey, where you go? It's the last time he's reportedly seen in the Wayne County area. Soto is an Hispanic male. He's five feet tall and weighs about 140 pounds. He goes by the name Chino, but has multiple aliases, including Fernando Arana and Aaron Ariano, with variations of both names. Investigators say he could be in Goldsboro, Mount Olive, or Michoacan, Mexico. If you have any information regarding the whereabouts of Alex Soto, call us right now, toll free, at 1-866-43-WANTED. Or log on to our website at ncwanted.com and click report a tip. You don't have to give us your name. Stay with us. We'll be right back to recap tonight's cases. Welcome back to NC Wanted. We're in the Hillsborough Courthouse in Orange County, where dangerous fugitives finally face justice. Now it's up to you to help make that happen. Let's review tonight's cases. Detectives tell us in 1985, Richard Bear escaped from the Wilkes County Detention Center. He was awaiting trial for the murder of Sherry Hart. But authorities believe his sister may have romanced a jailer to look the other way, as Bear was allowed to escape from his cell. Ever since, Bear has been a fixture on wanted lists throughout the country. Today, Richard Bear would be 43, but around the time of the murder, he obviously looked younger. He was described as between 5'7 and 5'8, about 175 pounds, with brown hair and green eyes. Authorities say it's possible he's altered his appearance, changed his identity, and may even be dressing as a woman. He's a Mexican native who managed to escape police custody during a drug roundup in the Wayne County area in 2004. Alex Soto is described as five feet tall, weighing 140 pounds. He goes by the name Chino, but has a number of aliases, including Fernando Arana and Aaron Ariano. Authorities believe he could be hiding out in Goldsboro, Mount Olive, or Mexico. Anyone with information on tonight's cases should call our toll-free hotline at 1-866-43-WANTED or go to ncwanted.com and click report a tip. You don't have to reveal your identity. Join us next week as we profile more unsolved cases. Remember, together we can fight to protect the quality of life we hold dear in North Carolina. I'm Gerald Owens. Good night.